Mike, try to speak as, as much as you can. What? You're a soft-spoken kind of guy. Okay, are you ready, sir? Yes, I am. Okay, so I actually know how this works because I was here before TechFest 1, amazingly enough. <laughs> but I always wondered before I heard this first thing exactly how the coin comparator actually works. I mean, I, I had a pretty good idea, but it's really interesting how it works and, and how coin comparators kind of advance to some more sophisticated technology and s the ways that they improve their products is real interesting. So um, I wanted coin mechanisms to be a part of TechFest. And so uh, without further ado, I'd like to present Mr. Michael Harris. What, what do you do? I'm production manager and field service Production manager. manager, field service dude from Coin Mechanisms. Give him a big round of applause. <laughs> okay. Well, as Randy said, I would like to get right started with exactly how a comparator works. Uh, literally, the product does just what it says. It takes one coin or, or a token and compares it to another. And how we do this, it's right down to it. <coughs> we start off with three precision wound coils. Let's see if you can see this. We encapsulate them in plastic. We Better speak up as much as you can, Mike. Like, I'm sorry to bother you, but. <laughs> anyway, we take the encapsulated coils, we stack them together into an assembly. And what we do at that point is we mechanically adjust the one of the coils in and out to achieve an equal amount of magnetic energy. So in other words, when we drive the outside two coils, we want the inside coil to see nothing. Or null is what it, the word is, null. And when the coils are balanced properly to a null, that's the starting place. That's the most important thing that if, if nobody remembers anything else today, that's the most important thing. The better the balance, the better it works. The better it discriminates. You can always make a coin mech accept. It's what can you stop. It's the frauds. That's the real issue. So anyway, what happens is we do start off with a, a balanced coil set. <coughs> I don't know what this camera's pointing at. There we go. We put a resident token in, a coiner token, and you leave it in the machine. At the point in which the customer's falling token matches, totally you, eclipses. You can tell me. Go ahead, uh, I go can hold my hand still in. enough. When they're totally eclipsed, directly over the top of each other, that center coil will again see zero or null. And at that moment, two things happen. One, the gate on the back of the mech opens, and we send out a sense pulse to the optic package in the host machine, telling them that there's one coming. And then the uh, IGT, that's the A optic, and they call that enable. Now what this looks like to the inside of the comparator, <coughs> when a mech is sitting there with a resident token in it just idling, the mech is sitting at close to five volts. When you have a falling coin come through, and if it's a true solid match, a good material match, and your coils are balanced well, in a perfect world you would drop to zero. So that's what the mech sees, is that coin is falling into the coil and falling out of the coil. <coughs> Pretty generic. If you have a good match, you're pulled to ground. If you've got a so-so match, like a token that's fairly close, but not a, a really good match, it would look something like this, with a little dip. Now what's important to know about that is on the front of the mech, there's a potentiometer, a pot adjustment. They've been there forever and ever. Here we go. Whoops. Right here. There you go. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, it won't sit there either. Now what that does, that potentiometer, is like an imaginary line. If you turn that pot all the way counterclockwise, 
that imaginary line will come all the way up to the top. And the way they were designed to work is you start to the right or clockwise and you drop tokens just until it accepts them all and stop. But reality in the field, in the casinos, the floor people just go wank and walk away. <laughs> so what that actually does is it brings that imaginary line up into the range to where you get slugged. That's, that's a problem. So if it's used the way it was designed, they work very well. They've been around forever. We've been the number one supplier of gaming validators for coinage since 1981. So I mean, there's hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of thousands of them out there. But that's one design flaw. You can force it to take slugs if you don't know what you're doing. It's one issue. There's also another issue that's a, a design flaw, and I'm not afraid to talk about the flaws, because as we move along and things improve, you'll see what we've done to correct for them. On a CC33, which is a classic $1 IGT machine, if the resident token is left out either on purpose or on accident, the mech will accept nickels. It happens. What happens, it goes in and out of null so fast that the size of the nickel is the right geometry to get to their optics just in time to trip it. Usually that's done by someone on the floor on purpose, and that's why the house gets so upset about it. Somebody goes in and literally takes that out on purpose and then leaves their shift. So what we've done to correct those problems is on the MC version, instead of coin comparator, it's micro comparator, it's one step up. We've done two things. One, if you don't have a resident token in place, it'll never power up. So that just took care of that problem right off the top. Two, because it's so much more discriminating, we've lessened the window. If you think about the CC as having a big window, you can turn that pot like this. The MC is much more discriminating. It has a tighter window, so you really can't force it as easily to take slugs. That was the second big step. You know, am I going too fast here? So basically, that's how comparators have worked forever. If you've got the right diameter, the right metal mass, they'll match and it accepts it. It's a workhorse. They run forever. Um, if you have coil sets that have drifted or have been taken apart and put back together because somebody poured a drink in it and they didn't remember to balance the coils properly and you have a badly balanced coil set, that forces you to turn the pot even farther and makes the slugging problem even worse. So that's why I say the number one thing to remember is the very first thing you do if you're ever in doubt about a comparator working, check the balance. It's just automatic, step one. That's Any questions? No, I can't believe I'm that good at this. <laughs> I was gonna say, you know, they're all napping, right? One of the other things that we moved on from the workhorse, the comparator is basically a, a very accurate metal detector. That's what a CC is. The MC product had to get smarter. Um, there's a lot of cheating tools that have been designed in the last few years where people are able to go into the machines with a, ver a variety of different hardware that they've made to be able to get through the mech and down and back and forth through the A optic in the machine to rack up credits. To be able to stop some of that, we've done a couple of things. One. Well, you got it. That black thing there. We put our own onboard optics. It's an A over B optic. Uh, for the last oh, five or six years, we've been running that product, and we've been using those optics for <coughs> ourselves. And we're doing a couple different things with that. One, we're checking the amount of time from the sense pulse to the A optic. So if the coin is perceivably getting there too soon or too late, we tilt. And again, with any A over B optic, if you go all the way through and try to come back and string, we just shut off and tilt again. So that's a couple things that we've done to try to eliminate cheating aspects. That was all internal to ourselves that we would shut off. 
We have offered the host machine the ability to be tilted by us. When we tilt, we can tilt any one of the OEM machines. But up until very recently, within the last year, the OEMs hadn't really wanted that option. They wanted to have the ability to tilt their own machine from their own optics. That has hence changed. With all of the cheating things that took place in the last year, and I'm sure if you guys have been in the industry a while, you know which brand names they are. But anyway, we're now doing optic emulation. And what that means is the OEM manufacturers today are now using our optics to credit their machines, and they're not even installing credit boards anymore. So if you buy a brand new machine today from any of the top four manufacturers, it's a good possibility that it'll have an MC in it when it gets to you. Because we're able to control that timing so much better. You don't have all that distance to go down to the bottom to get up and down. It makes it very, very difficult to cheat. So as you'll see, the CC product is being phased out. The OEMs are no longer wanting to purchase it. They want something with a little, a little more security. Price-wise, it's very competitive. It's, there's no big impact. Never seen so many blank faces. <laughs> Carry on. There's a vehicle. You're doing great. <laughs> when you say A over B, you're just saying A takes precedence over B? A is on top, B is at the bottom, and you have to be going the right direction and the right amount of time between them. And if you go B over A, you tilt. Go in the other direction for stringing. That's the same way the OEMs do it today. It's just they all have a varied amount of timing. Well, that was pretty simple. Yes? What's the allowance time? I mean, the time before you put the point there, get the sense of sense the amount of time from the sense pulse to the A optic, that's dependent on the machine itself, the OEM, their ramp speed, and uh, the diameter of the coins. So that's not a, a solid number. Different, different models will have different numbers for different customers. So when, let's say, uh, 25 milliseconds, let's say the, the setup is 25 milliseconds, and you exceed that on 25 milliseconds, it will send a field signal? It can. It depends on what the, uh, our customer wants to do. Can you repeat the question for the people on the uh, The gentleman asked, if you exceed the 25, that's uh, using 25 milliseconds just as an arbitrary number, if you exceed the amount of time it takes in our software to go from the sense pulse to the A optic, will it send out a tilt pulse? Yes, it can. Well, yes, we do. But will the customer use it? That's up to them. But it will tilt us internally, and we will shut off anywhere from one and a half seconds to one minute, depending on what the end user wants. That's adjustable for us. You can, you can set that for you know, a whole gamut a different amount of time. One of our customers actually has us on a tilt condition literally shut off for 60 seconds because they want the, the cheater to get discouraged a minute's a long time to be putting coins in him, keep falling out. It's part of a deterrent again for cheating. That's what it's all about. I was wondering, should I uh, demonstrate a uh, coil balance? Want to do it? Do the math. OK. Before you start that, what, okay. what do you recommend cleaning uh, uh, residue out of the coils with? You know, soapy water and a Q-tip before you do a balance. You know, if you're tearing a comparator down to clean it before you balance it, there's a lot of uh, Officially, soap, water. open water. Soap and water, regular dish soap. Uh, actually, if you run it on the cold cycle, you can even put them in a dishwasher. Okay. They're very, very durable. Make sure they're dry before you turn it on. <laughs> the, the, the subject of today is washing electronics in the dishwasher. You, you can. Yeah, you can. <laughs> um, unofficially, from a lot of the techs that I deal with when I'm in, out in the field, they use flux off. That's not a factory-oriented thing, but it happens. Okay. Oh, 
Nice. Going to be the second person today that I don't work, right? Duh. Let's see if I can stand this up in a direction where you can catch that. Okay, this is basically all it takes to do to balance the coil. I'm using the, the analog meter that's on the test station, but yeah, you, see that. yeah, well. Uh, that's just, is it a volt meter or is it an ohm? It's actually oh, a mic oh. micro amp meter is what it is, okay. yeah. Um, if you don't have this, you can use a, a, a regular scope that most of the, it's just this is convenient because it's easy to read. You take the set screws loose. You turn them in. These are just screws. They're not like potentiometers. They're mechanical set screws. And you just turn them in until they bottom. Should I be looking at the meter now? Do you yeah, probably. Yeah. Can you get it? Yeah. Okay. I'm just move over to one side. Don't, don't move. Shoot through the hole. There we go. All right. Okay, that's an unbalanced coil. And as soon as you get a little bit of deflection, you go to the other one. There's two. And just make sure that it moves. Now you want to turn them in one sixteenth of a turn revolution, just a little bit back and forth so they're even. And you'll see that once you turn them a couple of times, it gets like hypersensitive. And what are you trying to get down to as low as you can? As low as you can, and it's got to be below six. Let me see if I move the stand out of the way. Zero, if in a perfect world, you, you should be able to go to, to zero, but the reality is usually you'll sit around three. But the idea is go as low as possible. And if you go too far, it goes back up again. So that's your, that's your balancing point. You just want to find the best spot. That's all there is to balancing coils. Now, it's a microamp meter. Actually, it equates to be like 500 millivolts if you're using a scope. We use a scope the same way. Then. Same place. And put it at uh, 0.5. I'm spoiled. <laughs> the box is cool. Did you show everybody the box? Do they know what the box is? No. Didn't the, I thought that HAP had the literature in theirs. Isn't there a page for it? Well, I don't know, but you didn't introduce it. So why don't, oh. why, why don't, you just, why don't we show them what this is? Why don't we show them what this is? I mean, not to tell you your, your job here, but um, um, this is a cool thing. I don't know if you guys have one of these things, but you ought to get one. I mean, this is, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's not cheap. It's a thousand bucks or something, but Boy, it can make your life a lot easier. It has a built-in 12-volt power supply and, and all the stuff that you need, you know? Actually, right? if we're going to give it the marketing spiel? Yeah, give it the marketing spiel. It's okay. I think it's a good thing. I wouldn't say so if it was Other than just being called a, a test station, we refer to it internally as a game simulator. Uh, what it actually does is it, it'll simulate most of the functions of the, of the game. If we send out a sense pulse, it'll tell you if it got there, how long was it. If it was a tilted, how long was it tilted? You can do an inhibit, which is a max coin, so you can make the, uh, the mech inhibit just as if the machine would, and it'll work for 12, 24 AC, and 24 DC, so it covers all of the manufacturers. Actually, it works for our competition, too, but don't tell anybody. <laughs> <laughs> On a CC, oh yeah, and, but also, which is sold separately, but it, at the same time, most people, it's a regular stand which allows you to fast feed and do all the balancing and all in one place. And all of the products, again, will fit in it. Just makes life easier. So if you have a fast feed condition where it will take a coin one at a time, but it won't take it when a customer tries to, to power it. I think it's on it. No. No? The all aluminum one, is that the one you're talking about? No, this metal one. But no, no, but I mean. It doesn't have this on it. Because I know the all aluminum one we made probably only one season. 
I will make a note to find out whether it's retrofitable, though. You have another question in the back. Yeah. I had a question. Uh, we've got some IGT-I games that actually use the 13-volt carrier. Yeah. Actually, 12 and 13 volt is, is compatible for us. They called it out as a 13 volt, but you just use the 12 volt setting. That was a good question. What exactly is the difference between inhibited and uninhibited? Inhibited is the function where the machine, the host machine, can tell us to stop accepting without turning power off to us. This is what they're selling. It says made from heavy duty aluminum, so it's obviously not yeah, this. It's not this one. I didn't. I wonder if they just need to rewire, rework that, because that yeah. isn't really what it is. No, this is what we're selling. Uh, the, the, the question I can expound a little bit. In the S Plus machines, the 24 AC, they used to turn us on and off. Every time IGT got to max coin, they would turn power off to us. And everybody knows it's not a good thing in electronics. So the 13 volt version, we stay running all the time, and they just tell us to turn on and off. It's, it keeps it more temperature stable. They tell you whether to inhibit or not, not to turn off the power. Right, turn on and off acceptance. Acceptance. Yes? The rail assembly, mm -hmm. is that still adjustable? <laughs> I'm already. No, I have 13 on there. I'm sure that's whoa. Did you say item 16? Are you on page four? <laughs> yes. And that was what I was going to do next. On all CC and MC products, the party was talking about is a rail that's on the outside. And again, if you're going to go ahead and look right at the sheet, he, as the gentleman said on page six, item 13. What well, we've done in, at, in the field, I should say in the factory, to make life easier, in the early days, the techs would take two coins with scotch tape and make them eclipse. You remember I mentioned earlier that that's when you get your best null is when you're eclipsed? So the, the techs would take scotch tape and then drop it in and set that rail adjustment. That's the third adjustment on the side. Well, what we've manufactured is some, we've actually analy analyzed tokens to make perfect matches and mounted them on sticks. And that's the next step I was going to do. You just take the sticks, which is part of the uh, that other kit. And this one's not balanced. <laughs> As you, I don't know if you can. Oop, get my hand out of the way. It looks like it's not gonna either. Trouble shooting time. There it's going. Do we need the casinos going through these, or will this have them? There it is. Um. Where we get them from? Yeah, well, you need a, like, if you're doing a $5 game or something like that, you need a business one to put them on the bench or $50. Well, actually, we, we get our tokens from the Mint, and we get them all analyzed so that they're a perfect match before we make these. But if you were going to do it using the tape method, you would want to use your own house's tokens. But I don't really suggest doing that, because if you have a wide variety, you could actually make your life worse. Well, you may find you might have to try a different couple combinations of, uh, of coins. Because that's the whole premise behind coin comparing. It does just it. It compares one to the other. And if you're starting with a mismatch on material, that was another reason that we had the potentiometer in the first place, is because for many years, every casino wanted to take everybody's tokens. So we had to be able to make it adjustable enough to take tokens from all these different houses. Well, that's not the case today. Cross-play is dirty, dirty the business. Opposite, yes, absolutely.
Nice. Oh well. Come on. It's one of those screws he said he was going to lose. <laughs> oh really? Uh. <laughs> and he did. Yeah. <laughs> so this is a quick recap. What we've done is we went from a, a single look for a, a single null to looking for a null, how long it takes to get down to the optics, which direction it's going, and offering the customer external tilts if they want it. That's pretty much what we've done. We, we know where the coin is, and we're also offering credit output. And that's happening as we speak. That's pretty much it for this model. Use the same what? I couldn't hear the last word. Yes. In the pamphlet, I, ha I gave all of the test outputs and all of the, uh, the pin, pin ins. Every one of our models is there, and you can go by looking at simply the type of connector that sticks out. There was a point I almost forgot. All of the products that we make follow the same family suit. In other words, if you have a CC16, you can plug in an MC16 with no changes of anything, no harnessing, no nothing. It just plugs in. And where I'm going next, the intelligent comparator is the same way. They're completely plug and play so that you can take a, 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 our latest product and put it in a 15-year-old machine by just opening the door, plugging it in, and walk away. There's no bracket train changing and just it's a direct plug and play. It depends on the model. Where it says test point, it would, doesn't matter which one. The, there's only one test point that's truly out for that on all of them. On ICs, I think it does say raw and null. And I think on the rest of them, it just says test point. Mm -hmm. when, you, when you were doing your alignment, you did the alignment in the back out of point? Like, this is the back of the sensor coil. The rail adjustment. You were doing the air balance, and then when you were doing the rail, you put the coin in? A pair of sticks. Okay, Two. So, so you need, you, you do this, you put the coin, you put the actual coin in for the rail adjustment, but you don't need it for the air balance. That is correct. Uh, the question was, when do you use coins in to balance and when not? When you adjust the sensor coil itself, it's a true air balance, and the rail is with two matching coins eclipsed whether it's on sticks or on tape or whichever way you want to get there. Tell you the truth, the rail adjustment, I've never had to change one yet in the field once it's been set. But the sensor coils, once you take them apart to clean the grenadine out of them, <laughs> they have to, you absolutely have to balance the sensor coils once it's been disassembled. And uh, another suggestion is, this is not etched in stone, but I get the feedback from the field. Before you take the stack screw out to clean this, to disassemble it, take the, uh, the two adjustment screws loose first as an automatic. Before you take it apart, crack the two set screws loose and then proceed. Because that way you'll never forget and leave them sticking out when you put it back together and you'll never get it balanced right. So that's an automatic. Take the set screws loose before you disassemble it. Then you'll be in good shape every time. Any other CC or MC questions? Um, this is probably AP equipment I'm using. But uh, we've got a problem with R1 burning out C1. Nothing uh -huh. the gate to stick open. Um, CC 33? 33, 16. We've got a problem with that as well. Uh, we have some field service bulletins to address that. What happens for, for everybody else's benefit? IGT's machine needed for us to draw more current to turn on their triac. We didn't draw enough to turn on their triac, so we put a load resistor in to purposely load, and it caused a lot of heat. Well, the heat would rise up and dry out the, the primary filter. The, the lytic would dry out, and that's what happens. And then you keep turning the pot until it chatters for a while. 
yeah. Um, the field ser service <coughs> bulletin for that was when you change that cap, put the resistor on the back of the board. And then it's, it just takes care of it. Because those caps really only have a two or three year life expectancy and with that heat rising on, it shortened it a lot. We took care of that problem internally probably four or five years ago. That's what we've been doing, but I wonder if there any recurrence. You haven't had a recurrence since you did started doing that, have you? Uh, there's been a few more caps that even after some of the back forward that we still have to change out. Really? The 24 volt machines run pretty hot inside too. If you want to know another hint, take the cover off. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't say that, did I? There's just two tape recorders taped, no problem. <laughs> okay. Actually, I'd like to move on unless you wanted to take a break. Uh, it's up to you. I mean, yeah, it's only going I, half an hour. I can keep yabbing. The next step that we took to try to stop cheating and to help the casinos who now want better discrimination and less crossplay from houses in the neighborhood. So what we've done is on a standard, where did I lay it? Set it down here someplace. Here. If we could get a shot of this. On the standard CC and MC product, the coils themselves, the sensor coil and the coins have been on a center line, meaning that the core of the coil is lined up with the center of the coin. And what that gives you is this V. When you hit the eclipse, you get a V. To get more information during that time that we're validating, we've moved the coin, or we actually moved the coil over. So it's no longer on center. And we've changed the geometry just a little bit so that we don't know on eclipse anymore. We know just before eclipse and just after. And during that true eclipse, we're actually what we call anti-null to where we actually go out of null for a moment. So what the mech sees internally, now this is again with a perfectly set matched balanced coil and, and good tokens. You see one null, an anti-null, second null, and out. And that's done a few things for us. Once it gives us two chances to see how good the null was. We also measure the distance between the nulls, the amount of time it took to get from here to here. And varying materials, different kinds of alloys will give you a different anti null. So we're able to discriminate now, just not looking for a single null. We're looking for two nulls, timing, and a, a value of anti null. Now, that means that we have to know what materials you're, the house is using. We have to know what tokens are going to be used and what material, what dimensions, what thickness, so that we can dial in for the house. All of the major casinos in the last few years have gone with this system. That is Bellagio and Paris and, and Caesars and Aladdin and so on and so forth. But you can't generically take a mech now and just use it anywhere, because we have to know what type of signature that coin is going to give us. In the first few years, we put that information onto a prom, a removable prom that's on the board so that we could make a generic $1 IGT Mac and put it into any one of those houses by changing a prom. Well, it worked real well for us, but the regulatory agency wasn't too thrilled because you can change parts around. They didn't like it. They wanted more tighter discrimination. So today, we actually flash that information right onto the board, onto E-square. The prom is still there. It's still removable, but it only holds the operating information for the mechanics of the mechs. All coin signature information is now in E-square. And I'll just keep right on going. Does everybody understand that?
that once we make a Mac a how if we make this a Caesar's one dollar Mac, that that Mac is a Caesar one dollar for their specific coins that were minted for their house to stop crossplay. Just as another example, uh, I said different alloys will give you different amount of anti null. That's why I, I had put the second picture on here, because sometimes you'll see one like that. Just totally different alloy. That made life a lot easier for us, but that wasn't, that's not really the claim to fame. They took it one step further, and they wanted individual signatures for their own properties. I don't know. Let's see if we could zoom in on those. Which one do you want? Okay, I'm gonna hold it in my hand. What do you want to film? I want to be able to see this the ring. Mark? Yeah, to see this one might be able to, easier to see. It's a little, that's a different color. It's actually minted too. Yeah. You see those rings that look like the banding? It's like a Fiesta plate. <laughs> know what Fiesta is. That's actually a barcode. So the house has got its own specific code that's stamped on their coins. And what that looks like to the mech, and these are different codes that are on yeah, here. I, don't, I just wanted to see if we can, if you can, we can eyeball the difference between them. This we, one looks wider than this one. This one's narrower. Yeah, and they, we also offer different positions. Oh, this one's on the outer ring and the other ones are on the inner ring. Too. The difference in position where this one is versus this one. Smart mark, or what do you call them? You call it something else. No, it's smart mark. Smart mark. Doesn't IDX call it something else? Uh, they're X mark. X mark, that's right. Yeah. Yep. Intelligent comparator. This is actually how we do it. We've got a barcode reader, we go in and we look at that pattern. And this is what it looks like to the, to the mech itself. And there's different codes. I'll be able to show you on the laptop when I drop the different coins. You can see literally the different codes and how we can discriminate. <coughs> By having the ability to read when that smart mark happens, we are able to, thank you. We're now able to stop shave tokens, which is another big issue. I don't know if everyone here is aware of when you take a good known house token and take 40 thousandths off of the outside edge. When you put it in, it'll go right on through the mech, right on in, and right out of the hopper not being counted, so it double pays out. So if you go in with a tray of them, sit there long enough, you can empty the hopper and get all of your cheating tokens back. <laughs> Houses weren't too happy about that either. So by us being able to see when the mark comes in exactly relative to the waveform, if you shave material off of the outside edge of the token, the smart mark moves closer to the edge, and then we can tell when to shut off. Does, is that this one, is that closer to the edge and that's further away from the edge? Yep, you got it, because it got there sooner, it got there too got fast. There sooner, right. And we build all that into the, into the program. Now for end users, for, for the people like yourselves that are on the floor and working on the bench, the essence of this product is really the same. The most important thing that you can do for any comparator of any model is balance. That's step one always. With IC, there's just one more issue, and that's the focus of this. Which you're going to show us, I said. Yeah, I'm going to show you how to do that. Um, that focus never changes. In other words, it doesn't drift or go out of focus by itself. But what will happen is if you're in a house that's really, really heavy into cigarette smoke or you've got a, you're in a house that's got a low ceiling, uh, it's kind of like getting cataracts. Now we're pointed in a downward position, so we never collect dust, but that tar gets on the lens. And we do suggest that you clean it. And you can actually use uh, you can use the wipes that are in all the casinos. Yeah. 
The only thing is wait for a second to dry and then use a Q-tip to make sure you take any haze off because that's real good about taking the tar off. It's not something you have to do all the time, but if you've got one that's acting up, that's the first thing to do is just clean the lens. You're right. <laughs> Change harnesses on there. I want to try to catch that. Okay. That's the real. Yeah, let me just, just show it to you. This is the opto there. This guy right here. They even put a conformal coating on the top, or is it just silicone? Oh, it's just silicone. It's uh, more SMGs, as you can see. Surface not the There's the actual opto. While well, you've got that yes. in your hand, you yes. see this little plastic thing? I do see that little plastic thing. <laughs> that was put there for a reason, and I'll show you. It looks like an expensive cable holder, that's for sure. It actually does two things. and One, it holds the wires out of the way, as you say, but it also gives you a finger grip. Let me take these out of here. We suggest oh, that for removing this guy. it was designed for this. It's like this. It gives you a lot of leverage. Oh, this one's tied together. No wonder I couldn't move it. <laughs> Too bad. Put, like this? put this. There you go. There you go. Oh, like this guy. I don't see what you're talking about. It's this side. I mean, there like you that. go. Oh, yeah, you had me going on the wrong side of the mechanism there. Look. Now you got it. But it hurts. It's got those that's little screws sticking out there. It. It that's why the plastic oh, thing's Oh, I get it. Oh, I get it. It hurts before. So they put the plastic thing on it so that it doesn't hurt so much when you do this. Yeah, you know what happens? This damper lever, <laughs> this damper lever will never ever break in service. You'll never open a machine and find one that broke off by itself. But no one ever breaks them. What happens in the earlier stuff, when you'd open a comparator, you always open it from the front when you want to take the resonant coin out. But there's a lot of meat there on a regular CC and MC, there's a lot of plastic to catch on. This is, these are very precision and, and small, tight little coils. And what happens is you're not paying attention, they go like and there it flies. So that's why we suggest if you're going to take the resident out, and I'll turn it around to do this, you just pull this back and take it out. And while you got this in your hand, did it, you notice too, we've eliminated that rail adjustment you talked about before. Let me set this down. This token holder it has a couple of purposes. One, it eliminates the rail, so we have no more third adjustment. That's just gone. And two, to do coil balancing, this acts as a uh, like a gapping tool, like a feeler gauge. And I'll show you, after I show you the screen and the balance stuff that's on my laptop, how to do this. But that's part of your adjustment. It's actually a tool. And it's already on the product, so, and it won't work without it, so you don't have to worry about losing it. <laughs> well, if you lose it, it ain't going to work. I was worried about that. <laughs> I, I, I do have to tell you a story, though. I, but in one of the very first deliveries we did of those, we've actually this product's been out in the field now. This is the ninth year, so it's not new. It's just becoming really popular now. In one of the earlier deliveries, I got a phone call. This casino was frantic. They thought it was packing material and threw 350 of them away. Oh, <laughs> I can see where they were. But, what, but the ironic part was you had to take that sheet out that said, do not remove. Oh. <laughs> I have several stories similar to me. You know. We only ship them 20 in a box. So that was a lot of sheets of paper they threw away with the instructions. The IC product is um, dimension and den denomination specific. Um, not to house to house, but like here in the States, all dollar coins have to be 1.47. So
So when we make an, an IGT $1, we make it using this code, and we're, I'm just getting a step ahead of myself, but that's fine. We have this token here is a manufacturer's test token. That's our token. It's got our code, and it's got a, a different alloy than is used in gaming. So what we've done is we send our mechs out of the factory as what we call MTT, manufacturer's test token, so that IGT or any of the other houses, they all have them, they get MTT dollars. And at casino level, we change them to the house. So generally it's more a, right? Well, it started off at the $100 and then went backwards. And uh, all of the houses we do now are dollar and up. And we've been doing 50 cent. And now for the euro overseas, we're all the way down to 24 raw millimeter, which is basically a quarter. So we've got the capability. But here in the States, a 50 cent token is the smallest that anybody makes because they're not worried about security at that level. That's, that's the point. But they are den denomination specific. So if you got a dollar mech, now, if you've got a dollar Bally and a dollar IGT or a dollar Sigma, you can change boards because the carcass, a dollar is a dollar is a dollar is a dollar. They're all dollars are the same. So it gives you some flexibility, but it still keeps the gaming board uh, off our back here. Hope I answered your question. Yeah, you did. Thank you. Is it your car? Yeah, I wish. <laughs> Positive thinking. Actually, we've added in quite a few things. I don't know if you guys can actually read that. Where do you want them to read? Let's start off in the upper left-hand corner up here. There you go. Now, the, this laptop, which is basically a heavy-duty version of our pod, which carries all kinds of information in it, the laptop does not have any of this information in it. It's getting the information from the mech itself. So the mech is telling it that this is an MTT $1 revision zero and a gate timing of four, which tells me that it's a dollar size. I don't expect you to remember all this stuff at once, but it actually tells you internally what it should be. Let's move over to right here. There's two pots on these. There is some adjustability. We offer three-tenths of a volt from factory setting. There's one for the smart mark and one for the coils. It'll actually tell you, and you can't see it on there because it's the, the coloring isn't there, but Wait, what am I looking at? right here, oh, I see. You, can't, you can't really see it. Wow, it says recommend, recommended. Anyway, it'll tell you recommended voltage. In this case, it's 1.7, and the mech is actually set at 1.5. And the recommended for pot S is 3.4, and it's actually sitting right now at 1.9. So it's telling you easily what the factory said your adjustment should be if somebody did go in there and mess around. And Is this a piece of software we can download from your website? Or at the moment, we're running in, we're running in DOS and they're selling it with the laptop only, but it's going to be released. You buy the laptop to get the it's software? Cheap. They're really cheap. Okay. It's amazingly cheap. I don't know. Our cheap is your cheap. Yeah, right. Our cheap is cheap. Our cheap is cheap. Now, we also have this, fe the balance coil balancing feature is in the handheld customer pod. And what this is, is these two little arrows <coughs> denote that value of six. You'll see and if I squeeze this coil and put it out of balance. So you can balance. We're looking at a little scope display. Is that what we're looking at? Yeah, this is a, actually a freeze frame of four channel color scope program. There's really? nothing special about the laptop. It's in fact, uh, I've given a few of them away that don't even have a hard drive. Run off a floppy. 
There you go. Okay. I thought I'd show you guys what the mech actually sees. Heck, let me drop this. It doesn't see anything without the tokens. Okay. Okay, now what you're seeing here is the is what we refer to as the anti-null or the two nulls. And this is the smart mark. It doesn't seem like there's any grooves in the smart mark. There's one tiny little groove at the bottom, that's all. <laughs> that's just I brought some pretty dramatically different codes so that oh, you can see. see. Okay, cool. There's all kinds of stuff in the middle, but yeah. Uh, this mech also d did not accept, and there's a good reason for that because this is an MTT mech at the moment, and the coins are Mohican Sun. <laughs> so I wanted to show you how simple this is as, as an end user. When you, if you buy a bank of new machines and we haven't dealt with your company before, <coughs> you'd end up with one of these because they'd come in as MTT. And I wanted to show you really how what simple MTT stand for? manufacturer's test oh, token. Okay, right. That's, and it doesn't matter what manufacturer it is, if you buy an IC from like Bally's or any, any of them, they'll come in as an MTT, unless we knew ahead of time and had a chance to test with your own house's tokens ourselves. Let's get plug this in. And this can be done on the floor, too. And this, it, it just read off and says it's an MTT $1. And this pod, that's what we refer to this as a pod, is a Mohican $1. And this is what it takes to change this from an MTT. Hit it once. It says you want to do it. Yep. It says it's done. Verify. It's now a Mohican. All of the pro... Pro, now I can't talk, parameters for Mohican Sun's coin signature is now in the Mac. It was just that easy. Nothing to choose. <laughs> These actually will hold up to 12 different denominations and it talks to the Mac so you can't wrong select. When you plug this in, if that happened to be $100, but it came up $100, you really can't, can't make any mistakes. I know what I was going to do. One more thing. Yeah. It also has the capability to read the voltages. It's telling you right now that C is at 1.5 and S is at 2. In this case, it doesn't tell you what it's supposed to be like it does with the laptop. No, but what we actually do is we put a laminated, not this one because this one's a house one, but we put a laminated sticker it has all of the denominations for that house and the values right on it. This was designed to be used right on the floor. This is a tool that you take right to the machine so you don't have to drag everything back to the, to the lab. If something's not working, you can tell right away if somebody's been messing with it. It also will do, I don't know if I can prop this up here. Can you read that? Well, look, at look at the screen once. Can you see it? No, 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 it's got no, no, no. probably too far the other way. Right? There you go. And you can see that that balance is really, really high. Well, the reason it is is because there's a resident token in place. It should be really high. And again, you want to be below six. And it's right there. Six blocks in this case. We use the same volt, number. Whatever, or tenth of a, or ten, ten millivolts. Actually, it's one. One millivolt? Yeah. Okay. Or milliamp. F 500 milliamp. Okay. 500 millivolt. <laughs> okay. Well, that's right. But anyway, it's always six. It's either six with this, six with that, or six with this. Okay. That's the only thing you have to six remember. Anything. Six L of I. Okay. I was going to. Actually, you can. Well, what did I do with this? 
I'm going to show you how to balance this, and I'm going to use, I don't know if I'm going to keep from knocking that down. If you have to balance one of these, yeah, see if, yeah, see if I can hold my hand still. Let's say we gave this thing a bath. Sorry, we'll figure this out eventually. Everything's, everything's so slippery. What I'm going to do, and I'll, sh I'll show you this. <laughs> let, me see, let me just show them what you're doing there, if you don't mind. Where are you? There I am. Okay. I'm just going to crack the back screw. There's what exactly are you adjusting? On this particular sensor coil, I'm kind of going backwards. Instead of having two screws in the back, we have one in the front and one in the back. So they're independent. And what we're trying to accomplish is to have the least amount of clearance between the coils as possible. The closer you can keep the coils together without having a coin drag as it goes through, the better it reads. So instead of having a big gap in the front like on the earlier stuff and you could only adjust the back, we now have the capability to adjust the front and back. And what I'm going to use as a gauge for the front I'm actually going to use this, the token holder. And I'm actually going to do it right before your eyes. Oh, this one's adjusted. Perfect. Take the front one loose. And I'll show you this on the neck in just a second, but this might be easier to see. Once you take this loose, this is going to bind. You just pull it up a little bit. Keep my hand out of the way. Turn this just until it gives, and no more. That's the front. Should you feel slight drag? Yes, just a little. It, it shouldn't. Like a feeler gauge. Just yep, it slight. should just drag through there. And then at that point, you would adjust the back screw, which I don't have to do on here, but I do have to do that on here. <coughs> Let me do the front. I'll show you exactly how it works. It's pretty simple stuff. I'm going to stand it up. Okay, just a little bit of feel. And you can see now we're going to go over okay. here. We're out of balance terrifically. Okay. And when it's going to go to the back screw, just turn it down you to. Watch the monitor in front of you, uh, Mike, if it's easier. Not. And this one would go down to five. That's it. And as far as mechanical adjustments, that's all there is. One of the other things that I think everybody will be happy about with the IC products is they don't drift. The earlier uh, CC and MCs, they were under so much load that in time the heat inside the machines, the plastic dries and they slowly close up and go out of balance by themselves. So from the factory we suggest that uh, regular CC products should be balanced at least once every two years, just to make sure, or any time you bring it into the lab for any reason. The ICs, are, their geometry is different. They're not under so much load, and they really don't drift. So you're not going to have to be balancing sensor coils with the ICs all the time. Only if you have to take it apart to get the soda out. <coughs> I'm trying to think if I missed. <coughs> Let's kind of show them a couple of different codes. We got any questions at this point, guys? I was going to go to a dramatically well, different. Yeah, the green one we don't use in the States, so I can get rid of that. Now, that's the same material, meaning that these two coins are the same exact material. They're metallically and diameter identical. They are. They're from the same, same mint. They're literally identical. And as you notice, the, uh, the W or anti-NL is pretty close. But look at how dramatically different. Instead of having a U, and it didn't accept either. Get this one. Now this one has the same code in a different place. As on earlier, but you notice that the ma there's no match. Yeah, none at all. 
I, I tried to bring a mixture so you could get a, a combination of difference to, to see what they look like. <coughs> and now that it, because I never changed the settings on the mech. things I wanted to mention was, if, if you remember before when this mech came up here as an MTT, it was telling us that the recommended voltage here should have been 3.4. Well, now that it's a Mohican Sun $1, it's saying that the recommended voltage is supposed to be 1.9. That's the only thing to keep in mind is when you have a mech come in or a whole bank of machines or you buy a new machine and it comes in as an MTT, Make sure you look to see what the recommended settings are. Because all these different uh, programs have different values. They're not generic. In other words, a dollar pot setting is not the same on every dollar. It has all to do with the signature. There's one question that hasn't come up here today that's usually one of the first ones. What does it cost? <laughs> Pardon? How do you adjust the voltage? Just what you said. The one of the first questions that usually comes up is, what do you what do you adjust and what can I turn? We actually, let me pull this out of here so you can see on the board. I can tell you what page it's on too. If you wanted to see that for these, in the lower right hand corner. On page 29. <laughs> In the lower right hand corner, there's two little tiny potentiometers. CNS, and that's what I was referring to on the scope and or using the pod. They're pretty well buried in the corner and they're very sensitive. I mean, you just turn that a little bit. We allow three tenths of a volt from the factory setting. And if you remember before with the, with the CC and MCs, you could go anywhere. If you go more than three tenths of a volt, and most of our programs, it'll shut off. Because it, it does not want you to try to make it take something it's not supposed to. So we give you three, sometimes four tenths of a volt to accommodate an extra buy. Let's say like you, you have a new tokens coming in or you do another buy, you might need to have a little bit of room because the new tokens coming in might not be exactly the same. We have to give you some adjustability to be real. But usually you don't have to mess with them. As a troubleshooting guide that you can do right on the floor is an aid. On the left of the chip, we put two little LEDs. <coughs> Those flash when it thinks that it should accept. So when you drop a coin in, if you've got C flashes and S doesn't, then you know that the mech said the reason it didn't accept was there was something up with the smart mark. Either the lens was dirty, it's not focused or it's the wrong coin. Or you've got a really terribly, terribly destroyed coin that that mark at that specific spot is just wiped out. But usually that's not the case. So you can actually go up to a machine, drop a coin in, and be able to tell what's going on. So if you're taking notes, when an IGT machine is inhibited, it turns us off on pot C. And there is an I.O. problem and sometimes with their boards if you plug us in live. <laughs> and it takes that board out. It'll show no credits on the machine and have us held and inhibit. So that we think that you're at max coin when actually that's not the case. 
that's another little clue. If you go up to the machine and you, it could possibly be one of their boards, or it could be us for some reason. I got one more little trick up my sleeve here. We also send the LAP programs out with a picture that what we saw, see here, and all of, the, all of the prompts on here are using the letters that correspond. So in this case, I'm going to hit P for picture. Talk about it. <laughs> I wasn't too impressed with that shot either. That's better. And I hit P for picture. And we put a reference from the factory. Oh, this, that's what it should be. That's what, that's we, what it is. Right. That's what we seen at the factory when we designed the program. And this is what that mech just saw. What's all this hash up here on the top right there? That's the lettering. That's the lettering around the edge of the thing? And it sees because all. Because it's in a different position in this case, we didn't see it. That lettering is in a different position. Right. And, on the real and because it, it's not even, some are actually tall letters and some oh, are stars. Okay. And the mech will always see everything. It might not respond, and it, in some cases it shouldn't take something, but it will always see. Even if you go up and take the chip out of it, any, any coin that you put in, unless it's really, really, really far away, it'll see it. And again, on refresh. You notice that, the, in this case, the smart mark is very close, but the anti-null is... So that's another... That's a nice little tool. If you've got one that you can't figure out why it doesn't work, you look at the picture to reference, and then you overlay the two pictures. And then you can, you can see what we saw. Right. I'm not really pushing these laptops today, but there is one other issue. If you're in a bigger house that has a lot of traffic, we can do upgrades through email, through the floppy disk. You can actually take a picture like this and hit Make Picture, drop it on a disk, email it to me, and I can pull it up on a system in my office so that you don't even have to send product ever back and forth. I can see what you see and you can see what I see. To help you understand some of the things that we look for at the factory, which is really inconclusive for you, but again, I was saying about how deep the nulls go. If you've got a mech that's binding, let's say somebody was really manhandling it when they snapped it into that reverse logic in and they bent the main plate, the main plate literally, when they snapped it into the door, they literally bent the plate. And that coin is now dottling at the top on its way through. This is ingoing and outgoing. If you see the first null is running a little shorter than the second one, you now know that you have either some kind of obstruction or gunk at the top, or you have a misaligned coin door, the head. I mean, there's all these little things that you'll figure out, but where before you had no idea of what was going on, now at least you can see. That's what makes it life so much easier for me. You can see what it sees, and you can solve a lot of problems that way. And I had actually seen that where I've taken one, put it on my laptop, and it looks perfect. Put it in the machine, and I wouldn't get the uh, C LED to light. So then I'd carry the laptop out to the floor, plug it in, and, and that's what it was. The uh, channel was cocked, and it was going thunk. Ugh. Smart mark focus. If for some reason the wires get caught in the door and they get broke off the back, and that's, that's one of the other reasons we put that clip on there is to hold these wires. We actually have an extra little tab here, too. Right here, we got a holder. And right here in the corner, a little tab. Yeah, you do. See that little J hook? I still see occasionally where the wires get broke off and you have to change the readers. The readers are very precision made. They don't vary very much. But 
Because <laughs> our parts are made out of a plastic nylon material, when we put them together in the first place, we change the focal distance, in other words, the distance between the lens and the inside of the smart mark by putting little rings along the base of this. They're ten thousandths in thickness, and we put either one, two, or three, depending on what gives us the best looking picture. All you have to remember is put back what you took off. Because if you have a mech that had three, and you have a mech that has one, when you change readers, it'll still be the same. Okay, so where are those? What are you talking about? They're there? right there. Oh, jeez. I wish you guys wouldn't do that kind of weird stuff. You know, this I kind of stuff is just a nightmare in the field. Let me give it a second to focus. See that little white ring right there? Down in there? Down in. There you go. That little ring right there. Oh, I see. Okay, great. Focus, baby. Come on. It's focusing on something else. There. That's right. Oh, mackerel. That's one of those things that you go, well, that's so thin it couldn't possibly really count, could it? <laughs> but you know, but, but how many angstroms wide is that? It's quite wide in terms of, of uh, wavelength of light. It's quite, it's quite thick for light. So, okay, so can you reiterate that again? Because I, I, I kind of understand what you said, but um, what's the deal there? It, suppose we take it all apart, we lose that thing, we're just hosed. Well, what will happen is it will become erratic. <laughs> and then you, you, the, uh, if you don't have any means of looking at it, if you're, if you're not looking at the smart mark on a scope, yeah. then you're, you are reliant on using the SLED. And you just add and subtract until it works. Oh, okay. Trial and error. They'll, they don't go bad on their own. Okay. They the really, readings you mean? Yeah. No, I meant the readers. Oh, the readers. Oh, really? Okay. The readers don't go bad on their own. Um, you mean that opcode never, you've never seen that fail? Uh, the, only, the early ones a couple of years ago before they were uh, static protected did, when you shuffle across the carpet and not remember to touch the door, yeah. that would take them out. But usually they, the wire gets broke. That's what happens. The only reason I really brought it up, because it doesn't happen very often, but is if you take it apart, be conscious that they're there, so you put back what you took off, is right now in Europe, they're doing a conversion from, from one type to another. And the depth of field is different on the tokens. So even though they're, they're going from one token to another that's the same diameter, the strike depth on the mark is different. So they have to be conscious of focusing because they're two different ones. One, one of the older tokens only needed one ring. The new tokens that they're replacing them with needed two because it's a different design. So I have to make sure I mention that, that okay. focus is important. If you've got one that, that the S light is not flashing, add, make sure the lens is clean and add or subtract one of those if you have to. I just had to make sure I mentioned that. Well, at least nobody's sleeping. Yeah. <laughs> no, I'm pretty much done. Are you done? You ready? I'm done. Uh, sure. Any other questions? Last chance? Okay, how about a big round of applause for Mike? Oh. <laughs>